Hello, and welcome to another chapter of Books and the World, a presentation of the Cape Cod Writers' Center. I hope you'll be able to stay with us for the whole half, half hour today because you will end up knowing places to visit, the regular ones and secret ones you may never have been aware of before. Our guest is the reason for all these sly little innuendos because he has written a book called Footsteps, a Cape Cod Travel Guide. And we welcome our guest, Christopher Suttleman. Hi, Bob. Nice to be here. Chris, Thank you welcome for having to me. the program. The pictures are very, very nice. They're your pictures, incidentally, too. Yes, sir. Yes, every one of them in there. I like the way the whole book is put together. But before we talk about sort of the inside of the book, why another travel guide? It seems that there are always travel guides about any area, especially Cape Cod. That is true. Uh, the difference with mine is that most travel guides stick to hotels, uh, restaurants, beaches, the typical places that a visitor would like to see. I stay away from that. I go with almost entirely historical and natural spots on the Cape that most visitors either wouldn't think of seeing or might not have time to see if they didn't know about them. Well, actually, reading your book, Chris, uh, not only the visitor, but the person who lives on Cape Cod has probably heard about many of the spots you talk about and write about, but a lot of others, that, well, they were new to me. And <laughs> really? See, yeah. that's, I was hoping to have that with people that have lived here for a long time, that they may actually learn something as well. Uh -huh. The book and the travel itself in the guide is kind of interesting in that you start at the bridge and go on 6A, looking into places all along the way 6A, all the way up to the end of the road in Provincetown. Then you come back on Route 28. So you go west to east and then stop for a moment, look around and then come east all the way back to west again. I decided to do something like that that was a little unique to make it possible for someone to maybe not see every spot in one day, but see as much of them in as little time and for as little gas money, which I figured that might be. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. All right, let's, let's start. If, uh, well, you can look in the book to jog your memory and certainly Absolutely. jog mine, but uh, starting at the bridge and heading east. What are some of the places you stop and talk about and write about? Well, I decide to, I stick, I mostly went to places that I enjoyed, figuring that most people would like them as well. I specifically, I really liked Boardwalk Beach in Sandwich. I actually was just there recently, and that's one I think most people probably know of it. And that's the really long boardwalk, um, and each plank is engraved. Oh, uh huh? And the story is actually that the original boardwalk was destroyed in Hurricane Bob, and in order to have it rebuilt, the town offered to have these planks, um, 25 to $50, you could have them engraved, and you could buy them, and that those donations. So your donation would actually build the boardwalk. Yes, and that's why all of these, when you go there, there's so many that are people's names and dedicated to family members, some that are dedicated to family pets. Oh. <laughs> and it's interesting. You could, you could take an hour just walking down the boardwalk reading each one. Each mm -hmm. one tells a story. I really like that. There are many popular places that everybody who stays on the Cape for a while or keeps visiting in the Cape know about. But there are so many places in your guidebook, Footsteps, Chris, that are off the beaten path. Uh, I specifically was, I was looking for places I knew that in my spare time I would enjoy taking drives on the Cape and after seeing so many of the popular spots, I would specifically seek out places that I had never seen before. Mm -hmm. And that was how part of this came up was the fact that I had a, a wealth of these places that I did not really share. I would share photos, but not really so much about them or where they were. I like to keep them for myself. And now I've, I've sort of spoiled that by sharing almost all You've of them. You've given away your secret spots. 
I actually had somebody the other day, they were the first one to tell me that I had given away their favorite spot, mm -hmm. and I, I made sure to tell them I gave away my favorite spot too, uh -huh. my favorite sunset spot in Monument Beach. I made sure, so it wasn't like I just gave away theirs. Yeah, the, uh, the book contains, well, I don't know, the whole gamut from relaxing on a beach, secret places, how to get to them. Uh, there's, a, well, there's a warning to some extent <laughs> about some of the low tide, high tide places. Uh, yes, that, that comes from the Cape Cod Museum of Natural History in Brewster, and that is actually a favorite story of my family, specifically my sisters, where I was just going there to shoot some pictures on um, Wing Island behind there. And when I walked out across the marsh, it was a little damp, the boards, just a little, not enough that I really noticed. And I was out on the island for half hour, 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And when I came back, the water was about two feet deep, almost the up to my- The tide had come in. And the tide had come in when I was out there and I kind of scratched my head and said, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, so. <laughs> I rolled up my pants and just walked back a couple hundred feet through. There was fish swimming around my feet, uh -huh. and it was, it's a story that I'll never live down. <laughs> no, with good reason. Uh, there are several places that you write about in your book, Footsteps, that are in the similar situation, uh, where the visiting uh, point of interest is a low tide point of interest. Uh, there are several, including islands that aren't really islands. Hmm. As in, um, you think of Lieutenant Island and Wellfleet? Well, if oh, that's one of them, yeah. That is one that is actually, it's an island at high tide. At low tide, you can actually drive out there. There's a bridge that goes over the marsh, but when the tide comes in, you can't even get to the bridge because the water goes around it. And that was one, in order to get the pictures that are in the book, I had to make sure that I, that I actually you, you know, Read the tide chart before you go out there. Absolutely, I learned my lesson. That was after the fact. This was, I went to Lieutenant Island after. Uh -huh. and that, what, what do you figure are some of the most popular places for the visitor or hmm. for the person who lives on the Cape? I would think for me personally, I love lighthouses. I made sure that the only lighthouses I couldn't get to were Point Gammon Light on Great Island and Yarmouth and Monomoy, because I couldn't get a boat out there, but every other lighthouse is covered. Those are the first places I like to go. I have a friend of mine that we actually go around New England and we shoot all of the lighthouses because... It, shoot pictures of it. Yeah, <laughs> I, yes, I should make sure I say <laughs> shoot pictures. I tend to say shoot and people will look at me like, what do you mean? No. I mean photographs. Uh -huh. Take photographs of the lighthouses. Well, how many lighthouses are there left around the Cape? I don't mean specifically, but just off the top of your head. I believe, if I had to harbor a guess, I think on the mainland, I believe there's 10. I could try to name them all, because there's Sandy Neck Lighthouse that's out at the end of Sandy Neck Beach. You have to take an off-road vehicle to go out there. That's seven miles each way on the sand. If you go from the parking lot down the Sandy Neck trails, and I didn't, I went out there, I didn't have an off-road vehicle, so I walked. I walked and all seven miles, and of course you have to walk all the way back. And I walked back, and when I walked back, this was in wintertime, around this time of year, Ooh. and I didn't count on it being so far. So I got out there, I took a few pictures, and on the way back it got dark, and there were coyotes howling, and I, I started running, I had these, um, the, the boat shoes the, um, with no padding in them. Oh, yes. And I'm running along the sand that's froze, and it was, I, I would like to say it was worth it. Oh, a very, very dedicated author. Yes, it's uh, dedication to the craft is what mm. I like to call it. Now, in your bio, of course, I looked on the web for your name, and along with the picture, uh, Chris, there were several, in fact, quite a few titles of things you've written. Ah, uh, yes. I, before this book, I was writing e-books and basically writing them, editing them, creating the covers and such, and putting them up on any site that would sell e-books, especially Amazon with their Kindle. Oh. 
And I started doing that in 2005. I was writing short stories, poetry books. I wrote a few novels. Those take a long time. And I started getting into travel writing about a little over four years ago. And that was kind of, I don't want to say my calling, but I really enjoyed, I enjoy driving. I enjoy visiting new places and taking pictures of them and then writing about what I see. Were those travel books uh, other areas and not, not just the Cape? Um, or were they mostly the leading up to this book, Footsteps? It, yes, it initially it started as Cape Cod. I did travel blogs. I ha it's actually the same title. The In My Footsteps title is something I've liked to keep. And I have a blog that's uh, about 150 different places in New England. The furthest away I've gone is Lubeck, Maine. And that's the furthest east point you can go oh. in the United States. And that, from here, it's about an eight-hour drive. Mm -hmm. And that's, I went up there to see a lighthouse also. <laughs> it's no coincidence. Right, and windmills, a uh, whole different subject, but there are several still around Cape Cod. Yes, there's actually, there's a few in the book, and there's actually one that I had never even heard of until after the book came out in Chatham. I believe it's the Godfrey Windmill. I hope I'm getting that right. I've, I actually went and visited it. The folks that are the curators of the Judah Baker Windmill in Yarmouth actually pointed me there because they couldn't believe I'd never even heard of it. Uh -huh. They're like, you're writing a book and you don't know this lighthouse, <laughs> I mean the windmill? Well, I understand that one of the windmills, in fact, he write about it in footsteps, uh, still grinds corn. It's a working min windmill. Is that the um, Judah Baker windmill? I don't, I, I don't remember. I, uh, look, I was looking at the pictures. Well, here's the Judah Baker windmill. Let's see here. I'm reading here. Um, I have to put on my glasses to read it, but, but... See, this is the problem with having written so many different things is that when some of them... They start blending together? They start washing over each other and then I... I feel like, I promise you I wrote it, and yes, it's, it's true. In fact, that brings up another interesting point. Aside from the windmill itself, several of the windmills and several of the lighthouses as well, Chris, have been moved mm. over the years, and some of them have had uh, sort of sad histories where they've burned down and had to be reconstructed. Yes, absolutely. There's actually uh, Chatham Lighthouse the one that stands now, there used to be a second lighthouse there. And that lighthouse actually was moved up to East Ham and that became Nosset Lighthouse and they repainted it so they didn't look identical. And before that lighthouse was in East Ham, there were three up there. And they were these little tiny ones called the Three Sisters Lighthouses. And they ended up there about a quarter mile now from the water. And they're in a little field. Uh -huh. and were they working lighthouses, uh, just a smaller size? Yes, they're very small. They're not. E they're maybe half the size of a normal lighthouse. And those ones that are in the field, uh, the, the middle lighthouse has the actual lantern still on it. The other two are headless, so mm -hmm. you really couldn't tell. It's sort of like Stage Harbor Lighthouse in Chatham where it's out there and it's got the basic building, but it's got no um, lantern on the top anymore because it's uh -huh. um, obsolete or discontinued. Yeah. Uh, a lot of lesser known places, uh, we could uh, bring up some of them. Where, you know, for example, I've, I've lived here now, not a long, long time as far as Cape Cod is ago, but for the last uh, 14 years anyway, and visited many times before that. And yet there are places I didn't know about at all until I read your book, Footsteps, Chris. Was there any specific one that caught your attention that you... Well, some of the Indian places, uh, mm. the Big Rocks, uh, geographical reminders of 10,000 years ago. Uh, in fact, you mentioned two Big Rocks in your book, Footsteps. Well, the first one that pops in my head is Doan Rock, and that I would have to bring up because that's my family lineage on the Cape. Yes, uh, I was delighted to say we're going to do a book interview on Books of the World with Chris, Chris Settleman, whose family has lived here since, what, 1600-something? 
Yes, um, my ninth great grandfather, Deacon John Doan, is one of the folks that founded East Ham in oh. the early 1640s. And if you go to the National Seashore and you go to Doan Rock and you walk a little ways behind it, there's the Doan Homestead. And that is, it says Deacon John Doan, and I was able to find him in my family tree. That's fascinating. I, I couldn't believe how far back I went. <laughs> it, it's my, my grandmother on my father's side, her maiden name was Doan. And that was the link in the tree that led me all the way back to 12 generations. 12 generations. It's, a, it's incredible. We're, the second Mayflower journey brought them over and they settled East Ham and Doan Rock is a part of my heritage. I'm glad that, that I can actually say that. Yeah, and the Doan Rock is, uh, oh, talking about 12 generations back. I, you know, I'm a little uh, sort of nonplussed. You can hear from my sputtering here. What sort of history did you discover? What, uh, what were your ancestors doing all these years? Well, the Doan family, I'll say this, we used to have a lot of land on the Cape. Actually, my grandmother used to say that we own the land that the Cape Cod Mall is on now. Oh. Now, I... I don't know how that went down, what we sold it for, or when, <laughs> but I know that my family, we would usually joke on holidays, oh, imagine if we still own that land, the mall's on it now, and I know that much. Uh-huh. The, uh, all right, now, the big rocks, I've made some notes here from, you, from your book. Uh, there are Marconi sites. I, I was aware that there was the Marconi over in the National Seashore area, yes. but there were two sites you mentioned in your book. Yes, there's the other one that's um, the Forest Street Beach in Chatham. And you drive, it's a very small beach and there's a small parking lot. And there's the actual beach. And on the other side of the dunes is a marshy area. And out there are four pillars that used to house a radio tower up until the 1940s. Mm -hmm. And that's, I guess, seen as sort of the unofficial second Marconi site. And if you go around, there's the Forest Street Overlook. And up there, you overlook the um, pillars. And it has a picture of the tower when it stood there with the four pillars. And then you can see, look out there. Obviously, the tower is gone now. But that was something I never knew about until I just started driving and stopping anywhere. Yeah, and the Marconi history itself, I mean, its own history, uh, dates back to the, what, the early 1900s? Yes, with um, the first transatlantic communication between Theodore Roosevelt and um, King Edward, I and believe, over in Great yeah, Britain. Yeah, counterpart in England, and that, that was the first signal. I just think, by contrast, in a handheld device today. Oh, absolutely. It's incredible know. when you think back to, and it wasn't all that long ago, no. just over a hundred years. As history goes, a hundred years is a blink in the Earth's life. But Definitely. But now you handheld and you can say, well, I think I'll see what's in London today and press the proper apps and get a picture of what traffic in London now. Absolutely. I can't be without my <laughs> smartphone for five minutes. I feel lost. Uh -huh. and it's unbelievable. Even when I was a child, I never had that. It was always just going outside and playing and now it's a little bit different. My nieces and nephews, they don't know of that world. No. And it's, it, I can't believe I can even say that. Back when I was a child. I remember as a kid, you'd come back in the house and someone said, where'd you go? And the answer was, out. Yep. And what did you do? Play. Absolutely. And now, now the kids don't go out. They don't visit all the sites you talk about in your book. No, that's why I'm hoping that this will interest um, the younger generation because it's not, I made it as easy as possible to find all these places. You can plug the GPS coordinates into your smartphone and it will just bring you there. All you have to do is just let the computer do its work. Mm -hmm. the, oh, we haven't mentioned museums you, because you stop in your travels east to west and west to east and so forth at various museums. There are more than just uh, one or two, aren't there? Oh, absolutely. I'm sure most people would be familiar with the Heritage Museum in Sandwich, which is great with the gardens 
And the classic cars, that's probably one that I would expect most visitors would go to if they had the time. There's the Coast Guard Museum that's in Barnstable, the Cumaquid Village of Barnstable, with the old jail behind it that that had gotten moved recently. Actually, some people in my family didn't know that it was there, that it had been moved. Oh. <laughs> so I actually surprised them. I said, you should know of all people. Yeah, but the, the, the old jail is still there. Yes, and the old jail actually has um, the carvings in the wood from back when it was first built. Um, I think from the prisoners that were held there and things like that. You, These are interesting things, things that interest me. I hope that other people would like to go and visit old jails as well. But Yeah, the, the carvings would be from prisoners who had very little else to do while they were incarcerated. Yeah, I imagine. I don't know what else they could do besides make a notch yeah. for each day they were in there. Joe was here, 1712. Absolutely. It's, yeah, that's a fascinating place. Uh -huh. what, what, all right, I'll go back to a question we sort of slid over before. For the person who's coming to Cape Cod and they say, oh, I know a family that's been there for 350 years. I'll call up Chris and I'll ask him, what things should I see in a comparatively short length of time to visit? Hmm. If the, whole, the recommendations, if the whole Cape is at, is at your um, disposal, if it doesn't matter how far you go, I would say definitely you have to go to Provincetown and go to the Pilgrim Memorial and go up in that and look around at the harbor. That's an easy one, because unless you don't like climbing steps, mm -hmm. then it's not as easy. Uh, I enjoy... Rock Harbor in Orleans, that's a great sunset spot. If you were coming back from P-Town and you stopped at Rock Harbor, they have where the boats come into the harbor to help you navigate in, they have these trees that are out in the water. They have, well, they have trees in the water in the harbor? Yes, and the trees will have road signs on them as reflectors to help lead boats in. Are they real trees or just stanchions of some sort? I believe they're real trees that have been put out there. So, I mean, they, they're definitely barren where they don't have a lot of branches. It's so the, the sort of the, uh, the markers, the port and starboard markers? Yes, and it makes sure that it, it leads the boats in and the, the street signs. I remember going there as a kid and wondering what these trees were doing out in the water, and it's... It's fascinating, and the sun almost always sets right, right over the water. I was there recently, and it was one of the best sunsets I'd ever seen. Uh -huh. And if you go on the western side is where everybody goes, and they all park and watch the sunset there. There's, even on the coldest nights, there could be 30, 40 people there. So if you drive around the harbor and you come around the other side, you're only 50 feet across the water, but there's nobody over there, and you get the same view with nobody there, uh -huh. which now has spoiled, that's what I like to do. <laughs> now I have, you've given it away. I've given <laughs> that spot away. That's one of my secrets, and I just, I didn't even think T twice. Tape this program so you were saying, oh. well, well, he was talking about where were the trees in the water. Yes, and, absolutely. I, I will freely give away these spots because I don't, I don't mind sharing. Mm -hmm. I've had plenty of years of keeping them to myself. <laughs> the, the Pamet is another area where high tide takes effect if you're going boating. Oh, Pamet Harbor. Yes, and they actually recently Turo had... Or just um, Central Turo? Yes, and um, they had recently the storms that washed away um, Boston Beach. That was one. They actually, when I was writing for the book, they had been uh, rebuilding uh, the breakwaters at the end of the harbor. Mm -hmm. And I think that was from a storm. The storms have been bad. Uh, Truro has been getting hit. Well, yes, on all shores, on the bay side and on the ocean side. You know, in fact, this, we mentioned the lighthouses have been moved back and uh, all the buildings and... Uh, Absolutely, yeah, there's... Um, I remember when they moved Nosset Lighthouse back 
that was when I was in high school in the mid 90s and actually Highland Lighthouse or Cape Cod Lighthouse depending on what you know it as that was moved back within the last 15 20 years as well mm -hmm. and that um, the shore they have the marker where the lighthouse was, was before they moved it and you can see the cliffs are eroding there that it's unbelievable yeah you know, and, and and in time sadly that marker would probably have to be moved back to saying this was where over there there was a lighthouse absolutely yeah it they have the observation deck now you can't go to the edge of the cliffs when you're at Highland Lighthouse mm -hmm. because it's so it erodes so quickly that they don't even want people standing over there well or then I will recommend as we close out our program Chris that you visit some of these spots soon. Yes, uh, sadly, yeah, I, I would have to agree with that. There's, I have a few in there that they don't even exist anymore, but I oh. included them for the historic value, like Billingsgate Shoal that you, in Wellfleet that used to be an island. And back 150 years ago, Billingsgate Island, I did a report on that in college. I had never even heard of it. And it was an island with over 20 homes. It had its own lighthouse, had a schoolhouse, mm. and erosion. So it was a whole working village. Yes, and it's now it's a shoal. So at low tide, you can walk on it. It's basically a sandbar. But people every now and then will find bricks from the original lighthouse foundation. Mm. That's something I would like to do someday. You can't stop Mother Nature. No, you can't. Mm -hmm. And that was, I realized that. Well, we're, we're finishing our program talking with Chris, Christopher Sutherland, and the book we're talking about is Footsteps, and as we say thank you, Chris, for coming in, I recommend the book for, well, for, for even residents to have for the visitors who come and say, let's go visit someplace. Absolutely. It's done geographically, so you can take a tour west to east, east to west, or just pinpoint interesting places with beautiful photographs to help you find what you're looking for. Thank you, Chris, for coming in. Well, thank you very much for having me. And the guest today is about the book Footsteps, a Cape Cod travel guide, and a very good one. And we thank you for very much for listening and watching in today on Books in the World. Thanks for viewing.